You know, during World War II, after the collapse of France, Hitler and the Nazis were eyeing the coast of England and thinking of invading the mainland of England, the channel, the coast. There's some books and movies made on this. But when Hitler began to think with his generals of how he's going to assault Britain, Great Britain, they realized that they cannot send land troops without winning the war in the air. And so they, 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 they stopped. But to say that at that moment, in those few days, the British were facing a bleak prospect is an understatement. But the British commanders also understood that if they are to rep repel the Nazis' attack, the RIF, the Royal Air Force, has to fly high above in much higher altitude than the Germans are able to. And so they did. And this was one of the main reasons why the British were able to repel the Nazis. You say, Michael, well, we came here on Sunday morning to get a lesson in, on Second World War and history. Now, there's always a reason for telling you whatever I tell you. <laughs> Because, listen carefully, fighting from above is God's strategy for his children to, will, to win the invisible war. That's God's strategy for us. And that's not, I'm not making this thing up, it's from the word of God. In fact, in Ephesians chapter one, verse 20, When the Apostle Paul is talking about God the Father raising God the Son from the dead, he goes on to explain it. He said, when he raised him, he meaning the Father, raised him, the Son, from the dead, he seated him in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. But that's not all. Every name that is named, I want you to remember that. Every time you watch the news and you panic, remember that Jesus has sat by the Father in the highest of heaven above every name. I don't care how powerful that name is on the earth. Jesus is above that name. But not only name in this age, but the age to come. When the father raised the son from the dead, he gave him the highest spiritual altitude possible. No one can ever get higher or even close. He set him above all rule, authorities, power, and dominion. He placed him above all the angelic realm, That is the good angelic realm and the evil angelic realm of the demons. The Father said, Jesus, well above Satan, well above all his demons, and well above all his authority. He said, he said him, above all of your circumstances, above all of the events of history, above all things. Can you say all things? All things. In fact, a thousand years earlier than the time of our Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry, a thousand years, the Word of God prophesied exactly that. In Psalm 110, verse 1, the psalmist was telling us that this is what God the Father said to God the Son. He said, sit at my right hand until I make all, how many? All your enemies to be your footstool. But I'm also aware of the fact 
that in all the seven decades plus I lived, we live in the most self-focused times. We're self-focused. And so whether genuine or not, somebody might ask the question, he said, well, that's good for Jesus. What, how, how is that going to help me? Well, that's okay. Uh, you know what? The Bible anticipates that question. <laughs> genuine or not, the Bible anticipates the question. So he goes on, chapter 2, Ephesians, remember? Ephesians 1.20, now we're going to 4.6. He answered that question. But God, can you say that with me? Being rich in mercy because of his great love for us, even when we were dead in sins, he made us alive together with Christ. Look at verse 6. And he raised us up. So not just the Father raised the Son up, he raised us up. He raised us up with him. Now, let me tell you something. Here's something most Christians, including your pastor, sometimes forget. To our own detriment. We do tend to forget that. That he raised us up with him. And he seated us with him in the heavenly places, with Christ. I mean, he keeps repeating it so you get it. With him, with Christ. Now, I want you to look around you, okay? Just turn around, look around a little to your right, to your left. If you're, and that we have people watching us in hospital beds. There are people watching us all over the world. You might be driving a car. I have a friend actually told me he watches it because he has to work. He's driving. Wherever you are, look around you. Look around you. Look at your, look at your surroundings, okay? You see where you're sitting? That's not where you're sitting. No, I'm not giving you an illusion, but I'm just telling you that you, that's not where you're sitting. You, this is not where you are sitting. This is not real. You are sitting in the heavenlies. You are actually sitting in the heavenly places right now. Not here, not wherever you are. No, don't shoot the messenger, okay? This is how God sees you. This is where God sees you. This is where you spiritually are. You are sitting in the heavenly places. Unlike the RAF and pilots, you know, World War II, they had to go and put on the suits, get on the plane and go. No, no, no. We are there now. We don't have to do anything. We are there. Listen to me, please. Evil forces are conspiring to destroy our children moral absolutes. Evil forces are conspiring to shake our very foundation. Evil forces are conspiring to destroy the, our unshakable faith. But listen to me, they will fail. Amen. They will fail. Amen. They will fail. As heirs of the everlasting kingdom, we are already on higher ground. Wake up to it. We're already given all that we need to be successfully victorious over our enemies and his attacks appropriated. We already have vantage point uh, of being able to send Satan scurrying and running do it. We are the children of the king. Live like it. We are the armies of the living God. Act like it. We are the redeemed of the Lord. Believe it. Now, my beloved, the high altitude in which we have an overwhelming advantage over the enemy of our soul. God wills it so. As we sang in Martin Luther's song, God wills it so that we be at a higher altitude over and above. You see, military tactician, not technician, tacticians would tell you that if you ever occupy a higher place, you have an advantage. You have an advantage. God gave you an advantage when he redeemed you, when he saved you. 
He took you and set you at a higher altitude. The problem arises, listen to me, I'm aware of the problem. I have been a victim of it. Now, I don't like the word victim, but I've been, uh, I, I, fail, I, I fell for it several times, okay? The problem arises when the enemy tricks us or deceives us into leaving our high ground and come down to his murky valley. And when you come down (laughs) to the enemy's level, the advantage then belongs to him. And he ruthlessly uses it. I've been there. And I don't preach to you before I preach to me. If Satan can trick you into coming down to the murky waters of disobedience to the Word of God, he will exploit your vulnerability. If he can make you forget who you are and whose you are and makes you feel defeated because he wants to neutralize you, if he can make you forget even for a few moments, and we all do, even it makes you forget for a few moments that he is a defeated foe. He will make you feel hopeless and helpless. Today I want to talk to you about the three major categories or the three areas in which the enemy of your soul will try to pull you down from your high altitude that is the will of God for you. Three areas in which he will bring you down in order to defeat you. Everyone of these temptations that you have experienced in life, they come under one of those three categories. One of the three, every one of them, there are probably hundreds if not thousands of subcategories, but they all summarize in three. Every failure you experience comes under one of those three categories. And the Apostle John, whom the disciple whom Jesus loved, they always leaned on Jesus' bosom. He heard Jesus, especially when he recited his own experience of being tempted by the devil in the wilderness. He gives them to us. He summarizes them to us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Now, I don't normally throw a lot of verses at you. I try to be kind of careful and give you two or three, but today, I can't help it. <laughs> it's part of the deal. So, just be flexible. 1 John two sixteen. Here they are. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. These are basically three missiles that Satan used to try to bring you down from the high altitude in which Jesus has placed you and placed me. And oh, by the way, (laughs) I'm going to show you that these are the very three temptations that Satan, not one of his demons that he sent, his agents he sent to us, but he personally, I told you a few weeks ago that he only showed up personally once as, we, as, far, as, we, uh, concern, uh, as far as we know from the Scripture. Personally showed up to tempt Jesus in all those three areas. To satisfy his appetite all of them, to boost his ego, and then to try to get him to take shortcuts to accomplish his goals. Let's look at them very quickly, very quickly, okay? Three major headings, (laughs) which include everything that we ever, ever experience. Satan took aim at Jesus 
in every one of those three areas that John talks about, the lust of the eye, flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, every one of them. And praise God, Jesus defeated him in every one of them. In every one of them. The Bible said he was tempted in every way like unto us, but he never sinned. And praise God for that. Because it is because of his sinlessness that he is able to take upon his sinless body the sins of everyone who confess their own sin. Praise God. So Jesus, fasting for 40 days, he goes to the wilderness. (laughs) Now the wilderness, it was Satan's Las Vegas. That's where it's his convention center. This is where he gathers with all his demons and they have workshops and seminars and training programs. And so Jesus goes to the enemy's territory to face him down, straight down. Now, I'm not advising you to do this. I advise myself to do that. Sometimes I venture into his territory to snatch someone out of jaws of Satan, but it's not something that I advise people to do. Jesus could do it. We've got enough problems without us having to try it. <laughs> he will come to us all the time anyway. So chapter 4 of Matthew, now I'm going to stay with that for a little while, so you're going to have to flip back and forth. So Matthew 4, if you don't know, that's the first gospel, right? It's the first gospel. Am I right? Yeah. Just make sure that I haven't forgotten. Chapter 4. Here's what verse 1 says. The Holy Spirit, that's the Spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit took him into the wilderness, (laughs) led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That was planned. This was the start of conflict which went on all the way to the cross where Jesus rendered Satan toothless. Look at verse 2, 4, 2, Matthew 4, 2. You'll discover that's the first one here. First of all, it tells you that after 40 days. Now, I'm not going to speculate, okay? But after 40 days, it was getting close. And maybe the 39 days, probably just at the end of the 39 days. I don't know, but it's toward the end. It's getting so close. I'm telling you this for a reason, because that's part of the deal here. <laughs> I fasted, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. If you have your own Bible, underline the word hungry. Verse 3. And the tempter came to him and said, it's the first of the three, if you are the Son of God, actually, I'm going to tell you, this is a personal opinion, take it or leave it. It is my personal opinion as I looked at the text in the, every sideways and in the Greek, more accurate, more really literal, since you are the Son of God. Since you are the Son of God is more accurate translation. Command these stones to become loaves of bread. After fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, This is what you call starving to death. Now, we always kind of use this figure of speech, I'm starving to death. Now, this is really starving to death. And the prospect of bread to someone who fasted for so long is beyond enticing, beyond enticing. As the divine Son of God, Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter 4, when he was meeting with a Samaritan woman, when they brought him food, he said, I have food that you do not know of. He's basically saying them to them, my obedience to the Father sustains me in ways you will not understand. Obedience to the Father is my food as the divine Son of God. But as man, as the Son of Man, He shared our needs, our longing, our pain, our suffering. In every way, he suffered like us. 
So when the devil came to him, came to Jesus, it was at the very end of his fast. <laughs> if you miss this, you miss the whole point. Is that the very end of his fast, he was almost ready to eat, but not quite. It could be hours. It could be hours. I don't know. Because I don't want you to miss, this is an incredible subtlety of the enemy. The enemy is so subtle, and, and, and if, if, if you're not alert to it, you can easily miss it. Satan never questioned Jesus' divinity. Uh, he never questioned Jesus' pre-existence with the Father before all worlds. In fact, Satan really make the, the, it does sound very clearly to me that Jesus and Satan share this kind of uh, uh, secret. They both know a secret. As if to say to him, hey, you know and I know you're God's son. Hey, you know and I know that you can turn these stones into bread instantly. What is stopping you? What is stopping you? And you think, wait, wait a minute, but this is very reasonable, isn't it? You agree? Yeah. It's very reasonable. Jesus is hungry. He has the power to make bread. <laughs> His Father gave him that authority. Hmm. He could raise the dead, heal the sick, do all these kinds of things. He surely could bring bread out of stone. <laughs> he could supply his needs. What's harm in it? What harm can come out of it, right? I, I, I want you to think from, to, from a human point of view. <laughs> I'm going to come back to that because it's important. This doesn't even qualify as a temptation. When you really think about it from a, a human point, it doesn't qualify as a temptation. It simply makes good sense. <laughs> Listen, our whole society... Whole churches think that way. If it feels good, do it. If you need it, take it. If it satisfies you, go for it. Sex out of marriage, no problem. You have needs. Put your hand in the till. Everybody does it. You work hard and you need to numb your brains. You deserve it. Goes on and on and on and on. What was the problem? What is the problem? First of all, the problem is not whether hunger should be satisfied or not. Don't, don't, don't get distracted. That's not the problem. That's not the issue. What is the issue here? The issue is should Jesus break his fast before the Father's timing? Now, that's really, the, that, that, that's the question. That's, that's, if you miss this, you miss the whole point. Beloved, for Jesus, this is a serious breach of faith with the Father. Are you with me? This is going back on his vow to the Father. Just like unfaithfulness in marriage is a breaking of a prior commitment to your spouse. I want you to watch this. Watch this, please. Jesus is not saying that bread is not important. He's not saying that. Jesus is not saying, I don't need bread. No. Jesus did not say, fasting is not fun, but I've got to do it. No, 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 no. He said, my obedience to the Father, my commitment to the Father, my waiting for the Father's timing is far more important. Look at verse 4, Matthew 4, 4. Jesus responds, he said, it is written, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. My beloved friends, the secret of Jesus' victory is the secret of your victory and mine. 
when Satan tries to bring you down from your high ground by appealing to your desires and your appetites, all of your appetites, use the Scripture. Use the Scripture. It is written. But he doesn't get swayed. Satan doesn't get swayed. He goes to the second area. He moves on. After failed to get Jesus to satisfy his appetite before, the time, before its time, before the Father's timing, he goes to boost his ego. Listen, don't let anybody fool you. Or we all have egos. We all have egos. You got that? The difference is, some of us daily trying to sanctify our egos. <laughs> Others are not. So he goes from the lust of the flesh to the lust of the eye. How is that? Well, look at it. You see, Satan knows if he can get you to see it, if he can get you to see it, <laughs> if he can get you to feel it, if he can get you to experience it, if he can get you to taste it, he knows the rest is history. In Matthew 5, 4, 5, and 6, Satan takes Jesus to the highest spot in the city, the highest. They couldn't get any higher. And he says to him, jump. Jump. Hear me right, please. Here's what Satan is saying. He's not suggesting suicide, by the way. That, no, he knows better than that. The, 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 some people give Satan too much credit and some give him very little credit. <laughs> so be realistic. He's not even, suicide is, is out of the question. This is a very clever tactical switch. Satan realized that Jesus, unlike Esau, who sold his birthright for a pot of soup when he was hungry, that Jesus would not dishonor the Father to satisfy his appetite. So he goes for the ego. Satisfy his ego. I need to explain that to you. As if to say, okay, if I can't get you to satisfy your appetite, <laughs> I'm going to appeal to your ego. If I get you the lust of the flesh, I'll get you the lust of the eye. You believe the Word of God, right? Right? Now prove it. Prove it. Remember this. Jesus yet has not commenced his ministry. He has not started the ministry yet. This is the very beginning when he fasted in the wilderness, baptized by John, hasn't started public ministry. He hasn't started yet. And so Satan was telling him, start your ministry with a spectacular stunt. Remember this. Jesus knows God's promises. Right? Right? Jesus knows that the Father would have delivered him had he jumped. Right? Jesus knows had he jumped, angels, bodyguards would have come out of thin air to save him. Right? And he would have gone from being a nobody to being an overnight sensation. Oh, yes. Everybody wants to be an overnight sensation. <laughs> Don't ever forget, Satan knows the Scripture backwards and forwards. Satan knows the Scripture better than most theologians. In fact, Satan does something that most theologians do not do. He trembles at the Word of God. Oh, that we would tremble at the Word of God. So please, please, please be very wary of Satan's followers, these false teachers and false preachers. Oh, there's so many of them now. 
they will produce a verse from here and a verse from there and support their arguments for immorality. Be very wary of those who claim that they have discovered a new way of interpreting the Bible. Be very wary of those who say, isn't God love? Therefore, love is God. By that they mean any perverse love. So they make God out of love and they worship false gods. Listen to me. If they are appealing, I'm talking about the false teachers now. Listen carefully. If they are appealing to your lust of the eye, if they are preaching the gospel of greed, if they are offering Christianity without the cross, if they present a God that looks more like Santa, run. Run. The whole advertising industry is built on this area of the lust of the eye, isn't it? I mean, it's, they know if they keep displaying it in the right way for long enough, you're going to end up getting it. You see a 50-year-old looking like 20-year-old and you want to know the secret. Hello. You see a famous athlete wearing certain clothes, I want those. Someone eating certain food and make him look good, you're going to eat that food. Except that sometimes backfires. As many of you know, I struggled with my weight for a long, long time, and I still struggle with my weight. And this is years ago, years ago. I was really trying to go on a diet and exercise and all that stuff. And a friend of mine said, Michael, if you go on a diet, don't ever eat cottage cheese. I said, Obviously, he was having me. I didn't know. I fell for it. And I said, uh, why? He said, cottage cheese make you fat. I said, really? That's contrary to everything I read. He said, have you noticed how every fat person eating cottage cheese? <laughs> All these images a design to appeal to the lust of the eye. In fact, that is how Satan led or misled Eve. <laughs> he got her to watch the shopping network. <laughs> and it was all over. It was all over. Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw, see that? Saw. Underline saw in your Bible that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to what? The eyes. Underline the eyes. And desirable to make one wise, she took. From the last message I, I shared with you how under the leadership of Joshua, following God's instruction that actually does not make any sense going around this fortress, fortress of Jericho. It was not just a wall, it was a fortress. God destroyed it because of their obedience. And then they said, oh, wow, look at that. Didn't, uh, didn't we do some great, look, look, look what we did. And then they said, oh, there's a little town called, ah, you're right here. I said, oh, don't send the army there, just send a couple of hundred people. We'll take, we'll take that, that's nothing in comparison to what we did. <laughs> Be very careful. Be very careful. God then, when they got clobbered, completely defeated, he said to Joshua, had you come to me, had you prayed, had you sought my counsel, I would have told you that there is a sin in the camp. And in the book of Joshua, chapter 7, verses 20 and 21, Achan, the son of Cam, he said, well, I saw, I saw, and I took. You see, seeing doesn't stop. The next thing is, I took. Ecclesiastical, Ecclesiastes 1.8 says, the eye is not satisfied with seeing. Has to take. 
Proverbs 27, 20 says, never satisfied are the eyes of man. Hmm. Look at Jesus' response, please. Verse 7, Matthew 4, 7. Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Beloved, listen to me. Ambitions, even godly ambitions, must be tested, must be tested. We know that godless ambitions, whether physical hunger or hunger for sexual appetite or whatever it is, these, these appetites are fine in the legitimate context to be satisfied with pure motive. But when they are out of the legitimate context, they will bring you down from your high altitude. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye. Thirdly, the pride of life. Well, we know what pride is, but we don't know what the pride of life is. What is that pride of life? See, when Satan could not get Jesus through the door of fulfilling his bodily needs, his bodily appetite, the wrong way, he tried to entice him through the eye gate. And when that failed too, Satan says, you can have it all now. You can have it all now. That's the pride of life. That's the pride of life. You can have it all now. Doesn't matter how you get it. I was reading an article not long ago, actually, the certain percentage of young people who are actually saying they want everything that their parents had. And their parents worked for decades to accomplish wherever they are. They want it now. <laughs> they don't want to wait. Satan does this with Jesus on a much, 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 much higher level. A third temptation. Satan completely changed tactics. It's a complete change of tactics. Satan could not break Jesus under the pressure of appetite fulfillment. He could not get him to buckle under the allure of fame and spectacular and instant success. So he makes a very critical concession. <laughs> Make no mistake about it, Satan is making a concession here. And this one really needs an explanation. In order to comprehend this particular third one, it's so subtle. It's so subtle. I wish there's another word I can, I can explain that it, it can really go over the head of most people. It's so subtle. You have to understand that when God created the earth, planet earth, he handed the deeds of planet earth to Adam. He said, Adam, you are my deputy. Adam, you are in charge of planet earth. I'm making you in charge. You are my steward. You are, and I'm giving you authority. And when Adam fell for Satan's deception, he handed that deeds of creation, planet Earth, to Satan. Satan tried a coup, remember from the very first message, he tried a, a coup d'etat in heaven and failed and he got thrown out of heaven. But he succeeds through subterfuge and stilts to deceive Adam and usurp the authority over the earth. And that's why the Bible calls Satan the God of this world. 
He rules it. It belongs to him. His demons have garrisoned cities of the earth. Why? Why are they doing this? Because they impose a rule. They impose a rule. But listen very carefully. This, 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 this very important explanation here coming. Satan knows, listen carefully, Satan knows that his takeover of planet Earth is going to be challenged. It's going to be challenged. In less, less than three years, it's going to be challenged. So what does he do? He says, let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. Jesus, let's make a deal. <laughs> be very careful <laughs> when Satan wants to make a deal with you. You're going to lose every time. Trust me. It's always been God's purpose, and Satan knew it. It's always been God's purpose to wrest back the scepter from Satan and give it to his son Jesus. Ah, but not until after the cross and the resurrection. And here's what happened. The demonic equivalents of the CIA. Do you know that the demonic forces have their own DIA? They really do. <laughs> they have DIA, Demonic Intelligence Agency. Well, they examined all of the, the, I mean, they got some real good analysis there. So they examined the pages of the Old Testament and realized that there is a second David coming, there is a second Adam coming, that there is a new covenant coming, that there is a new heart going to be received by the followers of the Son of God. They knew that Jesus is about to destroy the power of Satan, fear and death. So what does Satan do? He offers him friendship. Isn't that sweet? He offers him friendship. As if to say to Jesus, although I know and you know why you're here. <laughs> although I know that you're going to take it back and you're going to take the deeds of creation back from me. I know also that you are powerful. Why don't we just settle this amicably? Just let's settle amicably. I'll turn everything to you. I'll give it to you now. I'll turn it over. You're looking for the deeds of, of planet Earth and the creation. I'll give it to you. I'll return everything that I took from God. Everything is yours and I will sign my name on the dotted line. <laughs> Oh, please, 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 please notice there is something strangely modern about this. Strangely modern. The allure of the shortcuts. The avoidance of conflict. The thrill of instant gratification. The avoidance of unpleasantness. The avoidance of pain and suffering. Listen to me. <laughs> Satan is offering Jesus victory on the easiest possible terms. Yeah, that's what you came for, right? I, I, you get it. Oh my goodness, I mean, you have to be totally unaware of his devices not, not to see this. There's more, by the way, there's more. Taking this deal from Satan, as far as Jesus is concerned, on the face of it, okay? Let's just talk about the face of it. I'm not going to get into the spiritual and even the historic. On the face of it, taking this deal from Satan, it appears that Jesus will accomplish his mission, right? He came to do this. He's got it. Think with me. Please think with me. Think with me. Think with me. I don't want to think for you. I want you to think with me. <laughs> when you think about it, the average person today, the average person today would look at this and say, man, let's go for it. What's wrong with that? That's what you call in the business world a win-win deal, right? Maybe okay in business, not in the spiritual warfare. 
Ah, oh, because you have to read the small print. <laughs> you have to read the small print. I have a dear friend in Australia. He's a lawyer for leading the way Australia. And he always chastising me if I'm signing something. He said, no, 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 you got to read the first one. I said, this is six pages. <laughs> he said, you have to read every word. <laughs> I said, thank God for lawyers. You read it. <laughs> got to watch for the small print. The small print. The, the, the problem is always with the small print. There's a tiny, teeny weeny, Little attachment, but it's deadly. It's deadly. Utterly destructive items in that offer. All this I give you. All you need to do, not much, just bow to me. Bow to me. And I almost think that it's not in the Bible, okay? So I, I, I don't want you to go and look for it. I almost think Satan says, you know, you don't have to bow all the way down. Just a little bit of a bow. That would be enough. Sure, Jesus would have gotten everything he came for, right? But he would have submitted his will to Satan's will. Satan would have allowed everything that happens in local churches today everything that's happening today. He would have allowed it just as, as, as if nothing changed, including preaching and singing. He would have allowed all that as long as they changed the name of the enterprise to Satan and company. Sadly, there are some churches, local churches, not the church of Jesus, it's victorious, is never defeated. Some local churches have handed Satan the keys. Be the same. What's wrong with it? Ah, we would have been still being separated from the Father. We would have been still be separated from the Father. Most local churches would have looked just to look today, except Satan owns it. Question, are you sufficiently forewarned? You can yell back at me, yes or no. Are you sufficiently forewarned? Yes. He will offer you the most generous bargain. He will offer you feeling good about doing good things. He will offer you being tolerant and nice. I think the word nice is what Satan used to shut the Christians up. Because they tell them, if you speak the truth, you're not going to be nice. The heck with it. I don't want to be nice. I don't want to be nice. I'm going to speak the truth in love. But I'll always speak the truth. Beloved, whenever... You are tempted to do or fall for any of those three temptations. Ask yourself the question. I've done that many times. I wish I could say that I've done that every time. No. Which one of those three areas is he tempting me in? Is he appealing to satisfy my appetites, all kinds of my appetites, in an illegitimate way? Is he appealing to satisfy my selfish desires, my ego? Or is he trying to get me to do my will and not the will of God? I always ask those three questions. Every temptation comes under one of those three areas. In every temptation he throws at you, in every goal that he wants to accomplish you, in you or through you, all are designed to drive a wedge about in your fellowship with the Father. He wants to 
put a wedge. He was push a wedge between you and fellowshipping with the Father because he knows that fellowshipping with the Father is the source of your strength. He knows that this is how he can weaken you because he knows this is how he can bring you down from your high altitude. So my appeal to you and to me, I don't only preach to you, I preach to me too, is to occupy the high places and stay there. Stay there. Don't let him entice you to come down. Above all, never, 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 never forget that his days are numbered and he will soon be vanquished and Jesus glorified. And that, my beloved friends, may be sooner than we think. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, we're watching him and seeing the same enemy who tried to tempt you in the wilderness. He's tempting every believer and causing the fall of many. And Lord, we cry and we weep over this and the condition that we see the church in and condition we see church leaders are in. And Lord, we cry to you, help us to stay at the high altitude where we are seated in the heavenly places. And that we will stay there.